Have you ever asked your school teacher for permission to get married? No? Well, if you'd been an Aztec, this would be just one of many things you'd have to do if you wanted to settle down. Welcome to A Day in History, where we will be deep diving into the astounding traditions of the Aztec people, from wedding preparations to married life and childbirth. As a society based on warfare, it's no surprise the shield became the Aztec symbol of protection. And now, nearly 1,000 years later, many of our biggest dangers are online. Thankfully, we have the perfect solution. This video is sponsored by Atlas VPN, which is, quite honestly, the best VPN on the market. Atlas VPN can keep you safe in so many different ways. It keeps your Google searches private, blocks malicious links, ads, and trackers, and even notifies you when someone is trying to steal your data. Not only is Atlas VPN the best on the market, but it is also the best value. Even better, they are currently running a huge discount, meaning you can get a three-year subscription to Atlas VPN for just $1.99 a month with a 30-day money-back guarantee. For the Aztecs, it would have been crazy not to use the protection symbol to keep safe. And today, it'd be mad to be online without having the protection of a VPN. If you're watching this video, we can guess you're a curious person who likes to deep dive across the internet. The best news is that Atlas VPN allows you to unlock content from all over the world, essentially giving you a magic portal to accessing sports, TV shows, and news from anywhere. Not only is Atlas VPN running at an amazing discount of just $1.99 a month, but it can also save you money by allowing you to access cheaper deals meant for other countries. And as if that isn't incredible enough, you can use Atlas VPN on multiple devices. I've got it on my iPhone, iPad, and computer. That's why I'm so calm right now. So if you are interested in keeping safe in this scary world, click on the link below. Aztec society was clearly defined with a complex, rigid social structure similar to a caste system. Families would arrange their children's marriages to determine prestige and connections and to strengthen their dynasty. With so many factors to consider, it's no surprise that Aztec marriages were an incredibly complicated logistical nightmare to organize. The boy's parents would begin the process of finding a lucrative match by consulting with a female matchmaker, or Aruatansa, in the Aztec language of Nahuatl. After securing a match, the groom's parents would need to negotiate with the House of Youth, a school that was part of the sophisticated, mandatory education system for Aztec boys. This would include inviting their son's headmaster and teachers to a special evening, where they would give grand speeches and ply the school staff with food and alcohol. Sometimes, a young man in school might realize he was ready to marry before his parents decided. In these cases, it was really down to the groom-to-be himself to grovel for teacher's permission, a process that included donating 12 large blankets to teachers. The best information we have about weddings come from surviving illustrated Aztec manuscripts, known as codices. From these, we know that weddings lasted a whole five days. They'd begin with guests arriving from midday for a lengthy feast and drinking session. Elsewhere, the bride would be adorned with red feathers and flakes of fool's gold on her face to prepare her. Whilst this happened, she would also be lectured by older women in her life and the groom's family on how to be a good wife. Surviving versions of these lectures have been translated as instructing brides to forever now leave childishness. No longer art thou to be like a child. By night, look to take care of the sweeping, laying the fire. When the bride was sufficiently lectured and decorated, she would be carried away by her matchmaker in a torchlit procession. At the ceremony, the bride and groom would sit on a woven mat whilst garments were placed in front of them. To symbolize the I do moment, the matchmaker would tie these two garments together to mark the official beginning of a marriage. And that's where the phrase tying the knot came from. After the couple had tied the knot, the soothsayer would lead the newlyweds to a bedchamber for four days of prayer. On the fourth day, the newlyweds would consummate their marriage and return to the still feasting wedding party. So what was married life like for an Aztec bride? Well, you would usually get married around 15 
Although some records show girls from poorer families getting married as young as 10. And if you were a bride, you'd expect your groom to be much older, maybe even in his early 20s. Before marriage, Aztec girls would spend their childhood preparing to be dutiful wives and efficient homemakers. But we do have snapshots that illustrate girls and women were encouraged to have autonomy and rights. One surviving manuscript shows that girls were encouraged to prepare weapons, such as staffs, to chase down and smack boys who ambushed them. And if you were an Aztec wife, you would be expected to be obedient to your husband. Spanish friar and missionary Bernardino de Sahagún wrote a general history of the Aztecs, in which he observed that an excellent Aztec woman was patient, kind, and a willing worker. However, he also wrote about wives' duties in governing, arranging well, and administering peacefully, all responsibilities that demonstrate that Aztec women could have levels of domestic power. As an Aztec wife, you might gain a positive reputation from efficiently managing your home. However, in pregnancy and childbirth, you'd be recognized as truly powerful. And, on the flip side, childlessness would be seen as a curse. Aztec culture promoted large families, partly because they needed soldiers for war. Therefore, women's ability to give life was sacred and had its own pantheon of fertility-specific deities. So, if you found out you were pregnant, you would be allocated your own personal midwife, or Tulambatul Quivisaito. This midwife would monitor pregnancy across regular home visits and provide essential advice, such as physical guidance, telling you to avoid heavy lifting during pregnancy, and to make sure you and your husband continue to make love until the seventh month of pregnancy to ensure a strong baby and one surviving record even notes a midwife giving mental health advice, instructing pregnant women to avoid sorrow, anger, and surprises so as not to miscarry or damage the baby. If you were a pregnant woman, you would become so important that your social status would match that of a warrior on the battlefield. And in the sad case that an Aztec woman did not survive childbirth, she would be glorified as a fallen warrior. With her body being guarded, and understood as a powerful, magical temple for a spirit that would go on to inhabit the clouds eternally. One of the best insights into married life comes from censuses undertaken following the arrival of the Spanish to settle disputes over tax collections. These censuses show a general Aztec tradition for communal child-rearing that harks the proverb, it takes a village to raise a child. Parents, grandparents, extended kin, and communities shared homes and childcare. Married couples had strict parameters for raising children. Parents were encouraged to ramp up severe punishments when a child reached the age bracket of 8 to 11, with disobedient kids being disciplined by having their hands whipped with spiky leaves and being forced to inhale smoke from burning chili. Food was also tightly controlled with children up to six years old being permitted one tortilla daily, and those between six and 13 were allowed to have one and a half. Possibly the strangest Aztec parenting ritual was stretching. Parents would hold their children and stretch their hands, fingers, arms, legs, feet, neck, nose, and ears, because if this was not done, the child would not grow naturally. From childhood to being adorned on your wedding day, fashion and aesthetics were incredibly symbolic for Aztecs of all ages. Everything from ear and lip piercings to hairstyles were visual indications of Aztec status. Boys and young men would wear their hair in a topknot until they took their first captive. Girls wore their hair down, flowing and loose until marriage. A married woman would rely on natural cosmetic products, such as rouge pigment to dye hair and teeth or yellow sap as a foundation. As a dutiful wife, you'd be expected to show your moderation and ability to behave appropriately by wearing the right amount of makeup. Attractive traits in boys and men are listed at length in contemporary documents, including being clean, not having an overfed body, but being smoothed like a pebble, as if sculpted by wood, not having acne like a tomato, and not being bug-toothed, yellow-toothed, ugly-toothed, or rotten-toothed, but instead having teeth like seashells that lay in order. Just like now, no marriages were without difficulties, and quite smartly, 
many Aztec couples were permitted to marry for a specific period, as opposed to forever. If couples did decide to separate, surviving court records show that husbands and wives could petition for this. The reasons for Aztec divorce include not being compatible, abandonment, misconduct or insanity by the wife, abuse by the husband, laziness by the wife, infertility or debt. The court would encourage reconciliation where possible. But if the separation was granted, divorcees were permitted to remarry. Another marital problem in Aztec culture has been recorded as being fixed with natural aphrodisiacs. If a husband and wife were struggling in the bedroom, documents show plants that excite the venereal appetite were used. Alongside plants, couples used ground porcupine quills, flesh of lizards and alligator parts for this, also considering these as cures to jealousy or a lack of love between husband and wife. If an Aztec got more desperate or these common cures weren't working, some Aztecs used deer snake venom or ground temelin beetles, although these were definitely a plan B. Why? Well, they are known as being toxic and often fatal. Fear not, whatever stage of life you might be at, weddings, childbirth, marriage problems, illness, or going into battle, the Aztecs had a specific god, deity, or ritual to guide you through. Many of these showed that life for married Aztec couples did not exist in black and white. But instead, Aztec culture understood morality as a complex spectrum in which actions could be both valuable and dangerous. Tlaxo Teotl, known as the Society Eater, really stands out. She symbolized sinful adultery and inspired sexual deviation. However, she was also the goddess of fertility, could cure venereal diseases, and possessed the unique potential to remove corruption from the world. Her myth and surviving illustrations depict her as going from a young, carefree temptress to her final form as a destructive goddess and terrifying hag that preyed on youth. The Aztecs even had a god of aphrodisiacs, controversially known as the Eater of Dirty Things. This collection of gods and deities would form knotty moral guidance for Aztec couples throughout their lives, with contradictions they must interpret to make appropriate decisions. There are many misconceptions about Aztec culture. These are rooted in the ways Aztec history has been translated and told. Aztecs are commonly seen as a male-dominated society that oppressed women. Historian Gillespie argues that this was a shift that only happened towards the end of the Aztec Empire. She explains that Aztecs originated as wandering tribes whose focus on craft, agriculture, and trade meant women were equally important. However, as the Aztec Empire consolidated in ways comparable to ancient Rome, men grew more powerful as military and political bureaucracy became central to society. Many depictions of Aztecs as prudish go against their rich mythology. This reputation may result from chaste Spanish conquistadors imposing their cultural norms as they recorded what they saw. A great example of the contradictions between Spanish accounts and what Aztec sources tell us can be demonstrated by the question of Aztec homosexual relationships. Spanish sources imply that there were no Aztec homosexual relationships. However, we know that Aztec laws against same-sex relationships existed. And as French philosopher and historian of sexuality, Foucault theorizes, to have a law against something is to establish its existence. Understanding of gender and relationships in these communities comes from mistranslations of Aztec codices. Recently, historians have argued that words in translations indicating same-sex relationships in Aztec documents do not originate in the text, but are a result of misunderstanding Aztec linguistic structures. Linguistic expert Kimball argues that both male and female homosexuality was known amongst Aztecs. Whilst these may have been frowned upon, Kimball writes that there is no evidence of suppression for this until after the Spanish conquest. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to grab the best VPN on the market by clicking on the link in the description. See you next time.